Retro Future. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. It is I, Dankit Lexicon. Say, do you like old technology? Do you like big battles? Well, you're in luck, because today we'll make a video on steampunk warfare and vehicle design. Finally! So, you want to create your own steampunk war story? Wonderful, but what is steampunk warfare? The cliché would be a war set in a fantastical Victorian-esque setting with steam-powered weapons and ray guns. Well, that's one form of steampunk, I suppose. But that is not what we're talking about today. We make a distinction on this channel between the steampunk aesthetic and the genre. The latter we define as cyberpunk in the past. Check our earlier videos if you want to know more about that. If you want to write fiction with an emphasis on battles, you're gonna have to make choices. First, you'll need to make a distinction between fantasy warfare and speculative warfare. In fantasy warfare, anything is possible. Its aesthetic tends to be style over substance, such as one-ton pauldrons big enough to crush its wearer's head, swords more likely to hurt its wielder than its opponents, and unwieldy firearms of any size. It follows the types of logic where the question, how can a country support tanks the size of the Notre Dame, should be answered with, don't think about it. This type of warfare is all about power fantasies. Brave heroes taking on entire regiments, wizards defeating swarms of demons with magical weapons or big robots. Logistics don't matter unless it's relevant to the plot. Army sizes, access to world resources, roads, bridges, bullet capacities. Anything sways under the need of the story. And more importantly, it needs to make the heroes look awesome. Speculative warfare, regardless of genre, comes from a very simple premise. What if? A short but powerful question that sets you on a path of exploration. What if is at the heart of most science fiction stories, like the Matrix, Ghost in the Shell and early Star Trek series. However, science fiction is about future prediction, and as I've often stated before, steampunk is cyberpunk in the past. It's one thing to speculate about the future of the tank. After all, we know the origins of the tank, its development up to the Second and Cold War, and in light of current events, we have an idea in what direction these will have to go to make it into the 22nd century. Steampunk in many regards is an alternate history genre, with some differences as I discussed in the previous video. But what about warfare? A great example of speculative warfare is Lost Exile, about which we made a whole summary and analysis. It goes into great detail on how the ships are designed, operated, and how these economically affect their respective societies. Sure, there is a hero, yes, there is a chosen one, but the hero is not that exceptional. Good, but no more important from the many pilots torpedoing the enemy fleet. What makes him special is his personality and his mission. The weakest link in this narrative is the girl who is the chosen one, but in the grand scheme of the narrative, it's a minor issue that I have with the plot. Even for future prediction, we often need to jump into the fantastical. We need to balance plot, character development, the limitations of our media, etc. This all comes down to creative decisions, starting with do I want my stories to be a power fantasy or an exploration? I suppose it could also be a metaphor, but this video is long enough as it is. So what about steampunk? First off, most of the steampunk war machines you'll find will fall under the fantasy warfare category. Essentially fantasy with a clockwork skin. In these situations, the aesthetic dictate the genre rather than the other way around. This is even the case in most speculative steampunk. Because everything needs to be steam-powered, yes, that is an aesthetic choice, writers create improbable levitation machines. And to make those work, they need to come up with fantastical solutions. Like the steam ball from Steam Boy, Claudia in Lost Exile, and other forms of magical bullshit fumes that have a lot more power than normal steam. I call this an aesthetic choice because there is nothing that stops you from using conventional technologies like diesel or electric engines. 
other than it being a trope of the genre. And before anyone starts, yes, these engines were already developed in the Victorian era, and yes, they knew that steam engines for transportation was a stopgap solution until combustion engines and car batteries would be commercially viable. Yes, the first electric cars were already driving around as early as the 1830s. But you say, does that really matter? We'll get back to that at the end of the video. But before that, I want to demonstrate an example of a speculative steampunk. Coming up with good hypothetical stories is hard for this genre because you need to rewrite the history of technological development and war itself. What sparked it, how did this influence society and industry, and because of our obsession with airships, we often need to delve into clock tech because we don't want our airship fantasy to go the way of the Zeppelin. That is the issue, because much of our technology is inspired by a problem that is likely unique to our story setting. Therefore, it is hard to generalize steampunk warfare, and that is the reason I postponed making this video for many years. Because we are in the middle of several military steampunk novels at the moment, we we'll use the setting of the Association of Ishtar to create a starting point to demonstrate my world building process. I'll focus on two types of vehicles. This will be the starting off point for future story and world building efforts. But before we start, one novice mistake is that authors want to expand their worlds too much. They'll describe entire campaigns or even wars. This results in a blend experience with generic battles. Instead of asking how wars are conducted, we should start with something small. So our premise is, how would the first tank be developed in our particular setting? And for that, I'll pass the word over to our own lore master, Mr. Bendelsmith. Why, thank you. So, armored vehicles. Let's start with a short summary of our own history, so we can compare and contrast. It's 1915. After a bloody trench war in France, the Western France appears to be at an impasse. To find a solution, the British created the so-called Landship Committee, led by a certain Winston Churchill. This group commissioned vicars for a new type of vehicle. Armored caterpillar tractors, or land ironclads, capable of traversing no man's land while under heavy fire. These vehicles were codenamed Water Tanks for Byzantium. What this committee developed would become known as the Vickers Mark I Water Tank, hence the name. To break the stalemate, this machine was designed to be long enough to cross trenches while offering protection to the infantry. A mobile bunker with machine guns and or cannons. The sponsors were on the side because of the enemy infantry hiding in the trenches. I could go on, but the point is that the Mark I was designed with a mission in mind in which it was... Okay. It was a new type of machine that had a lot of criticism from the get-go. Atop the eight-man crew, stuffed like sardines into a hot box, it had many mechanical problems. It was slow, heavy, and barely powerful enough to cross the muddy fields of Verdun. These were all valid objections, but the Allied command was desperate to break the stalemate as the bodies piled up and the soldiers' morale was sinking into a literal swamp. Thus, on the 15th of September 1916, the British Army fielded these untested vehicles near the Somme against the German lines. And they were successful enough, introducing the concept of armored warfare back into military doctrine. However, it wasn't the Mark I that would dictate the future of armored warfare, but the humble Renault FT-17, a small two-person vehicle with a rotating turret. By the end of the war, the French had built hundreds of them, and after the conflict, they would export hundreds more across the world. Over the next century, the tank concept would be tested throughout two world wars, the Cold War and the present. At first, it was all about armor, speed and firepower, but now electronic warfare and defensive countermeasures against drones are of increasing importance. 
But what if the first tank would be deployed in the 19th century? For that, we'll use our own association of Ishtar series for context. The following are just examples, but we might actually include these vehicles in our future operations of the association. First, we need to think of the origins of the tank concept. This would already lead us to the first issue, because tanks would probably not be called tanks for the reasons stated above, but armored tractors or some variant of that. Second, the association of Ishtar takes place in an alternate timeline during which, from the 1800s onward, portals to other timelines keep opening up. These rift anomalies are mostly harmless, but some lead to futuristic worlds that could impregnate engineers, generals, etc. with ideas for concepts far ahead of their time. In this setting, technological know-how is acquired through reverse engineering. It kinda goes like this. An operator comes back from a futuristic world with something as simple as an encyclopedia from a local library. Eggheads look at it, start developing a machine with the available technology and build a vehicle ready for trials. This is likely how they happen to come across the tank designs. But here's the challenge. Having studied histories of such concepts in other worlds, it's very unlikely they'll develop something akin to the Vickers Mark I because they already know the general shape tanks will take. This is kind of a shame, because that implies they would skip the multi-turreted tank designs and other unlikely contraptions engineers would have dabbled with without success. So, how do we go about speculating what the first tank would have looked like? When designing anything, there needs to be a problem. That would be an issue with any trendsetting technology. After all, nobody asked for this machine. Thus, you need to convince the leadership they need. Any form of armored vehicle. So, here's a six-step program on presenting a vehicle design. 1. Define the problem. In case of the First World War, it was trench warfare. 2. Gather facts and make assumptions. Well, these would be details such as muddy underground, trenches, no man's land, barbed wire, etc. Then define the desired resulting criteria. This would be any outcome resulting in their party winning the war. 3. Develop solutions. Well, in the case of a, a tank, it would be lots of armor and tracks. Step 4. Analyze and compare. Well, this is the hard part. You gotta weigh the pros and cons, like being invulnerable to being very slow. What would be viable alternatives compared to set solution? How they work in offensive and defensive situations? What would the support options be? Uh, infantry, artillery, etc. And what would happen if you concentrate them versus dispersing them across a larger area? And of course, 6. Implement the solution. AKA deploy them on the battlefield and hope for the best. Now, assuming we are in a post-Napoleon world, let's say the 1880s, what could the tank be used for? Let's take the Second Taiping Rebellion of 1880. The Taiping were a quasi-Christian sect that carved out their kingdom out of the Chinese Empire. Now wait you say, weren't they gone by that point? Yes, but not in our timeline. No, I am not getting into it. For the sake of argument, we're assuming the French, despite them being neutral in the conflict, had to protect their assets from the rebels who saw the French as heretics. The French had also developed an armored car by this point, meaning that it is tested technology. I chose this thing, the Chiron Garrido Void or CGV motor carriages. In this timeline, it was developed during the 1850s and made public in the 1870s. It's equipped with a 7mm Hotchkiss machine gun with a good speed of 15 km per hour, one of the fastest military units on the field. Other nations, like the concept, swiftly placed their own orders for this motor carriage. In a short time, the CGV proved valuable for reconnaissance and cavalry support. However, the cavalry feared being outcompeted by these machines, leading to a slow expansion throughout the various militaries. 
Regardless, the CGV-71 made their way to the French outpost in China to patrol the existing roads and support units on foot. But when, in the early 1880s, new hostilities between the Taiping continued, the limitations of the CGV-71 as a frontline combatant became evident. Taiping snipers would kill the crew and steal various vehicles. They would armor the cabin so they wouldn't happen to them, but even those field modifications often proved insufficient. CGV would turn out a new armored variant with better everything. These were decent improvements, but they came at a price of mobility, which is a valuable asset to have in a guerrilla war. To make matters worse, the Taiping developed elephant guns to blow slugs through the armor. Thus, the CGV-81, although adequate with additional armored plating and sandbags, was deemed to be too vulnerable in a support or even offensive role. Especially during sieges, the CGV-81 could only provide scouting operations in the surrounding countryside, a task traditional cavalry could also perform. Thus, the CGV-81 became a vehicle in search of a mission apart from being an armored taxi for generals. What the expeditionary force needed was an armored vehicle that didn't rely on speed but was impervious to small arms and could traverse the rice fields. Thus, these were provided with a new vehicle, an armored tractor. The FD-68 was designed and produced by one of France's most trusted companies. Peugeot was founded in 1803 as a manufacturer of metal strips, clockwork springs and saw blades. Eventually, they started manufacturing bicycles. In the 1850s, they dipped their feet into making cars, but failed to compete in a competitive market in a country where the majority of the population lived in the countryside, far away from car shops. Instead, they focused on tracked vehicles for the export market to meet the increasing demand for farming equipment. In the 1860s, they were approached for a covert government project to construct tracked armored vehicles, something that Peugeot excelled at by this point. Still, it took them many years to construct a suspension and engine versatile enough. By 1865, the first prototypes rolled out. One of these was the FT-66, also known as the Krak, but that's a story for another time. A limited number of FT-68s were ready by the time the Franco-Prussian War erupted in 1870, but the FT-68 would not see the front lines. However, during the... <coughs> By the time the Peugeot FT-68D was shipped to China and had nearly two decades of development, but barely any combat testing outside of activity, it had been upgraded from a two to a three person vehicle, a driver, a commander in front with a Hotchkiss machine gun and a gunner in the cupola with a second machine gun or 30mm high explosive grenade launcher. These vehicles turned out to be a lot harder to destroy by the Taiping. However, fuel was a problem, and even on a full tank its range was limited. Also, the rebels resorted to a new weapon. In a previous video we discussed the Mysore rocket and how it inspired both western artillery and space travel. The Taiping resorted to deploying rocketeers. Yes, that's what they were called. And yes, both the French and the rebels used them. Now these rockets were inaccurate, but that's irrelevant when you fire half a dozen at them at once. Although these explosive rockets couldn't pierce the armor, they could damage the tracks. They would also throw explosive devices underneath the tractors. And Taiping, being the fanatics that they were, often tended to throw themselves beneath the vehicle with explosives strapped to their chest. Oh, that turned dark quickly. So, anyway, during the second Taiping Rebellion, the FT-68 may not have been the super weapon some had hoped for, held back by limited technological capabilities of the age, but it was good enough to inspire future development of armored tractors. Over the years, it became an icon of the French military's abilities, and other nations scrambled to copy its success. However, it would take a while before armies became comfortable with this new armored weapon system and how they would be used within their respective geography and military traditions. However, the FD-68 would serve as a starting point of most war tractor programs. Thank you, Mr. Bendelsmith. 
Wait, I'm not done. Yes, you are. Bugger off. I hope that example was useful. Basically, we started with a simple premise. We looked into the history and French industry and let it snowball from there. Not only did we define the problem and implemented the solution, we came up with ideas on how the enemy forces responded and developed their weapons accordingly. We combined the existing lore that I created in our Gula Mali video, and voila, you have a unique history that can be expanded upon. But where are all the ray guns and Tesla coils, you ask? Well, here is the thing. Creators often get blindsided. Let's say you want airships that don't have the obvious problems Zeppelins have. So you create a levitation device and now your ships can fly. Wonderful. But why does this only apply to ships? Why does it not apply to anything else? The internal logic becomes flawed and once the readers see through that, it cannot be unseen. Weaponry is no exception. Another bugbear of mine is the use of airships in a setting where they also have planes. Even with levitation devices, planes are a far more effective solution, cheaper and easier to maintain, and a lot more expendable, and a lot harder to hit by anti-aircraft guns. Yeah, that's another thing that's often absent in such settings. Yes, we have advanced levitation devices, but somehow anti-aircraft cannons are beyond us. Apart from power creep, there is another problem. Theme. The Association of Ishtar is a series about what we call Cosmic Mystery. One of the themes is about humans fighting against greater odds. If we equip our vehicles with futuristic weaponry, what would make their enemies threatening or alien? It's one thing if you want to make Power Rangers fight Cthulhu, but a whole nother if you want to make a retelling of War of the Worlds. And we leave it at that for this topic. I hope this was informative and hopefully it also made you curious about our own steampunk universe. That reminds me that today we are launching a new book on Amazon. Enwin, Adventures in Responsible Doe Ownership is now available in ebook and paperback. To celebrate this occasion, book one, The Ranch in the Machine is now also available at a great discount for just $1.99. This offer will last till January 15th. By buying our books, you'll help us create more original art for the series, like these drawings by Johan Alexander and Alex Castro. As a matter of fact, we invite anyone to contribute their ideas to our setting in preparation of a tabletop RPG that we are drafting. I'll put a link with more information below in the description. If you want to read more, we have short stories on Ream Stories, or buy our books, whose stories are linked below. And with that, I bid you adieu, and as always, make things your way.